tiny bubble in the wine. Oh, I do love that Don Ho. Of course, he's no Johnny Sablon. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Combat Helmets of the 20th Century, or as we say on Guam, half a day. And I was just going through my recent copy of Glimpses of Guam, and it put me in mind of when I first started collecting helmets back on the island of Guam, I believe it was 1971. Got my first helmet, Japanese. So we're going to call this our origins issue. This is when a mild-mannered Manny Gentili becomes superhero Manny Gentili, mild-mannered helmet collector. Let's go take a look. The Museum of America Helmet Collection has been growing for years. My helmet collection actually started way back in 1971, when as a young U.S. Navy sailor, me and 12 of my radioman school buddies boarded the big silver bird that took us to the island of Guam in the middle of the Philippine Sea. Now for a kid who'd spent his whole life in rural Michigan, it was thrilling to wake up on this tiny dot in a huge ocean. Guam, although a part of the United States, was for me a far away and exotic land with plenty of white sand beaches, swaying palm trees, and gentle tropical breezes. And I'll tell you, for this young sailor, it was just like something out of a movie. We spent nearly every off-duty moment outdoors, enjoying the island, swimming and snorkeling in the warm, clear water occupied much of our time, and beach parties were always a great way to unwind after a three-day long shift. Another favorite activity was something called boonie stomping. More on that later. This was during the Vietnam War, so there was a pretty brisk operational tempo all over the island. Constant reminders that we were a jumping off point and a communication center for American efforts in Vietnam. There were always lots of ships coming and going. The Naval Magazine was a beehive of activity, ammoing up warships bound for the gun line. CBs and Marines were continually passing through on their way to the fighting, and B-52 bombers took off every night from Anderson Air Force Base bound for the war zone to return early each morning. But it was another war from an entirely different period that captured my fancy. One of the things that I really enjoyed about being on that little 32-mile-long speck of island is that history was everywhere. Ancient Chamorro history, as evidenced in the prehistoric and mysterious Latty Stones. Spanish colonial history, which left behind fortifications, churches, and stone bridges and walls. And the history of the Japanese invasion and occupation of the island during World War II. Everywhere you went on the island, you'd encounter reminders of that war from pillboxes on the beaches and deep in the jungles, to rusting gun emplacements still zeroed in on long past enemies, to Japanese command bunkers deep within the jungle. The detritus of the war was all around us. I found and brought home a hat full of war souvenirs. Ironically, they were from the war of my parents' generation. I even came across an unexploded Japanese mortar shell, for which this is the detonator. Yes, I would agree, I was young and stupid back then. The Japanese occupation of Guam was a cruel and dark time for the people of the island, who suffered greatly under the repression of the invaders for two and a half years. Finally, in July of 1944, American forces landed on Guam to recapture that island and liberate its people. Although it wasn't until 1972 that the final Japanese straggler, Soshi Yokoi, was captured and sent home, healthy but bewildered, to a Japan he had left a lifetime earlier. And this is the style of helmet worn by those Japanese invaders. This is the model 
steel combat helmet of World War II. The model 1930-32 is a distinctly Japanese design with a symmetrical acorn-shaped shell. The steel is only of moderate thickness and there's no rim or other separate parts. This would be a very simple and economical helmet to produce. The liner is quite basic with three leather pads sewn to a leather band secured to the shell with rivets. Long fabric tapes comprise the chin strap. This particular specimen bears the insignia of the Naval Special Landing Force. They were sort of like Japanese Marines. The model 1930-32 soldiered on after the war in Japan and in some of the countries that Japan had occupied. One of those countries was Siam. This is the Japanese 3032 with the Siamese insignia. This particular helmet has been retrofitted with a French style liner and chin strap. It was the Japanese 1930-32 that sparked my interest in collecting helmets in the first place. And it all started one sunny afternoon while boonie stomping on Guam. Boonie stomping is the island term for hiking through the jungle. And it was on one of these hikes that I acquired my first helmet. A bunch of us went on a boonie stomp to a place outside the tiny village of Jigo, site of the Japanese last stand on the island. The area is full of half-filled in concrete bunkers, old gun emplacements, and the detritus of war is easily found. From a series of Japanese water tanks, we followed a tiny stream as it disappeared into the base of a hill. We pulled back the brush to reveal a very small cave. In no time at all, we found ourselves crawling into that little cave, single file, flashlights leading the way. Eventually, about 50 feet into that hillside, it got so narrow we couldn't go any further. In that tiny, cramped, wet little space, I started fishing around in the stream bed right below me. And in a handful of gravel, I brought up a military belt buckle. Then we started looking around and there was a, a narrow ledge running along the side of the cave wall. And on that ledge, in the light, we saw human bones. And then from the head of the line, we heard the voice of Roger Jacobs, Jake Jacobs whisper, hey guys, Look at this. In the circle of light coming from our flashlights, Jake was holding a rusted helmet, the helmet of a young Japanese soldier who never made it out of that cave. And Jake brought that soldier's helmet once again into the bright light of day, a light that hadn't shone on it for 27 years. And now, 38 years later, here's that very helmet. A parting gift from Jake as he shipped off the island. The initial helmet in my collection and a memento of shipmates past, as well as a remembrance of a lost and forgotten Japanese soldier a long, long way from home. And that brings us right up to today. Here we are, oh, say 120 helmets later, now you know the story of how it all began. And that wraps up the Origins edition of Combat Helmets of the 20th Century. Next time we'll be profiling yet another really cool combat helmet. Until then, I want to thank you for stopping by the Museum of America. <music>